Okay. Welcome back everyone to our second lecture, BC212, Christian Apologetics. I'm going to look at the questions in the chat. So, this one question, John Paul. Are Muslims descendants of Ishmael or as it was started here, 680, it doesn't hold true. Another question is, do they call Allah as our God the Father and Jesus as Isa Nabi? All the converse should be accepted this when they mention. And I think related to that is another question from Elijah. Is the Muslim Allah same as the God of the Christian? So, um, yes, uh, the first part of the question, oh, John's question. So, traditionally, the Arabs are descendants of Ishmael. So, we know that uh, God had promised Abraham a son who eventually was Isaac, but before that, he had Ishmael, who then the descendants of Ishmael became, you know, uh, to say a thorn in the flesh or a thorn in the side to uh, the Jews, uh, the descendants of Isaac. And today uh, tr we trace. Um, that the Arab world, part of the Arab world, as descendants of Ishmael. But not all Muslims are descendants of Ishmael, because obviously you have Muslims all over the world, in India and Southeast Asia and other places who have no connection to the Arab world. They're just different races who have thereafter ex uh, embraced Islam. So, to answer that question, not all Muslims are descendants of Ishmael, but the descendants of Ishmael eventually became, um, you know, uh, came under um, under what the Prophet Muhammad started as Islam. So, to that extent. There is that connection. And they trace, theologically, they trace their roots back all the way to Adam. Um, and the second part of the question, which overlaps with what Elisha asked, you see, when, when, when the Muslim uses Allah, he's referring to God. But who is the God? Is he referring to the God of the Bible? The answer is no. Because the God of the Bible is a triune God. Allah is not. The God of the Bible came in. God the Son came into this world. That's not Allah. Who, he did not send his Son into this world. So to answer the question, The Allah that the Muslims refer to is not the same as the triune God of the Bible. It's different. So we shouldn't confuse the two. Now, when Muslims refer to Jesus as a prophet, remember they're not referring to him as a son of God. So just because they refer to Jesus as Isa Nabi, meaning Isa, Jesus the prophet, they are not recognizing Jesus for who he is, the Son of God. So it's not the same. So on both these grounds, it's very clear that the Allah that the Muslim refers to is not the God of the Bible. The Jesus the Muslim refers to is not Jesus the Son of the Living God. 
So accepting, or I should put it like this, accepting Jesus as prophet, as he's a Nabi, is not the same as accepting Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, eventually, if they make the transition saying that Jesus whom they refer to as a prophet is actually the Jesus of the Bible, okay, that's fine. But just referring to him as Isa Nabi, uh, you know, or a prophet would not be the same. And we should not, in our conversations, we should not refer to uh, Jesus as prophet, we should refer to Jesus as God who became man. Uh, that's the Jesus we want to present. But as a starting point, you know, yeah, they, when we say Jesus, of course, they are thinking Jesus as the prophet. We are thinking about Jesus, the God who became man, right? So this is different, but we need to be clear uh, about the Jesus we are presenting. Um, Jafina's question. Uh, Muslim to believe in Jesus, but they say Jesus pointed at the Father only. Then why are you worshiping him while well, you're supposed to worship his Father, whom we call as How can we respond to this? So, so this is where we have to talk about. Uh, so, when we're communicating with the Muslim, we want to emphasize that. So, as far as possible. We try to avoid bringing in this whole idea of son of God and son of man, those those titles of Jesus. You know, later on they would hope they can understand it. But when we start talking about Jesus, son of God, then obviously they have questions, you know. And but when we say Jesus is God who became man, so we present Jesus God who became man, which is true. That the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, or God the Father, or God the Eternal Word, God the Spirit the triune God of the Bible. God, the eternal word, became man. That as Jesus Christ. And he came to do, you know, set us free. So if we explain that, that it's not just, so on the earth, when he walked on the earth, he had the title as son of God. So that's it. So the son of God is only a title given to him when he walked on the earth. But who was this person? He was the eternal word, co-equal with God the Father, God the Spirit, who became man. When he walked on the earth, there was a title, Son of God, Son of Man, other titles, Good Shepherd, and so on and so forth. So if we let them know that this was God who became a man in order to save us, then there is no issue of, uh, you know, the title. The title is only describing something of his life here on earth, how he lived, and uh, uh, a son of God, son of man, so on. So, uh, yeah, so when we get into the notes, I will, I will maybe explain, and then we will see if that clarifies this, yeah. So, let's go back to the notes. Yeah, so when we are communicating with a Muslim, we want to emphasize a loving creator God. The, the, the fact that God, the nature of God, that God is a loving creator, as opposed to um, as opposed to a God that we just submit to and you know just uh, um uh, serve out of fear and so on. Then, secondly, we are talking about sin that affects the relationship between God and man. Sin that affects the relationship um, uh, between God and man. And the third point that we want to emphasize is about forgiveness. Now, like we said earlier, this whole idea of personal sin, personal forgiveness, is almost, as I would use the word, neglected. It's not emphasized. What is emphasized is uh, you've lived like a good Muslim. You follow the rules. 
as long as everything is okay in terms of you following you know the rules things are okay so this whole the emphasis on your sin you know you if you do something wrong your sin your accountability to god and you being forgiven by god is is not really emphasized ultimately if you live like a good muslim walk in submission allah will decide to accept you but we can emphasize forgiveness at a personal level right so and forgiveness as something you can know that you are forgiven so for how, how a muslim you know cannot know he's forgiven for the wrong he's done personally now, on what basis can he know that his sins are forgiven he doesn't know right but when we present jesus christ as the one who paid for our sins and uh, and uh, because of him you know we are forgiven uh, we can you know explain to them the importance of Christ's sacrificial death on the cross now in that context in that context and I you know and uh, just to point to something that they commemorate you know which they do uh, is to um, how Abraham sacrificed his son, which is which. See, they trace their back, their history back all the way to Adam. So Abraham is an important part of the whole history. Um, so we could use that to point to Christ's sacrificial death. I'm not saying it's necessary or important; just a thought, but. The, the point is to, to talk about the fact that God is a personal God. He loves us. Sin affects our personal relationship with God. And God came into this world to pay for our sins. So on that basis, we can experience forgiveness of sins. That is totally foreign to uh, the Muslim faith. That my sin was paid for so that therefore I can receive forgiveness of sin. That's, that's non-existent, no idea like that in their faith. Right now it is you serve, you follow, you keep the, you know, the five practices, you be a good Muslim, Allah may accept you. You say sorry for what you've done, but you don't know whether you're forgiven or not. You'll have to wait and see. But if we are able to convince them or help them see the love of God, God coming in the person of Jesus Christ, paying for our sins. And on that basis, our sins are being forgiven, that we personally can know we are forgiven. That's a powerful truth for them. Another important part of uh, The truth that we need to present, which is non existent in their understanding of religion or faith, is the fatherhood of God. We, we mentioned about God's nature, presenting God's loving nature uh, here, 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 that God's a loving creator, in contrast to Allah, who is just somebody to be served. And then when we emphasize that. God actually, we can actually come into a personal relationship with God and you can be a son or a daughter. That is, you know, quite startling or quite different to anything that they have been taught or they have heard. That God can be your father, that you can come into the family of God, that you can be a son of God, a daughter of God. You can call God your father, worship him as your father, and you have a very personal relationship with him. So that is a big point of difference. And lastly, the way we live Christian life. We emphasize a walk of love as Christ taught. 
we emphasize God's written word and we emphasize God leading us by his own personal presence. Now, so Holy Spirit, we can explain to them as God's presence in our lives or you know, they slowly they will understand. You know, when uh, the whole thing about incarnation, God the Son, this you know, and the Holy Spirit, they will come to understand. But initially, you know, we have to put it in simple terms. We say God's word, God's presence in our lives, as opposed to the decree issued by a local religious leader, because uh, this one is based on somebody's. I, I, as I would say, women fancy. Somebody's making a rule, and the rest of the community is following that rule. Whereas in the Christian life, we all follow God's word and God's Holy Spirit, and we have to walk in love. So that's how we live of a Christian faith, in contrast to fatwas being issued or decrees being received from. A local religious leader. So, just to recap here, what are we going to do when we share the gospel with a Muslim? These are the some points of emphasis: the nature of God, a loving Creator God, the importance of you know the emphasis of personal sin and how it personally affects our relationship with god explaining how forgiveness personal forgiveness can be received through what god did for us by coming into this world dying for us so when we talk about jesus talk about jesus as god who came into the world and now try to avoid using as far as possible the titles of son of god and son of man and all of that god came into this world which is true right so god came now if they do ask why you say son of god then we explain no on the earth he walked as a man in submission to god so he's called the son of god but other than that just focus on the fact that god came into this world as a man to bear our sin so we could be forgiven then we are emphasizing the fatherhood of God, that we can enter into the family of God as sons and daughters of God, and how we live the Christian life. Now, just some additional thoughts here. Is Like I said, there are many different reasons why a Muslim would come to faith in Christ. One is because of a personal supernatural encounter with the lord right whether it's through a vision or a dream or through a healing miracle or a powerful encounter just like we mentioned for the hindus so that's one way you we see hindus coming sorry muslims coming to faith second we see muslims coming to faith because of the the gospel accounts. That means, you know, there are testimonies of people, Muslims reading the gospels, seeing the life of Christ, and being shocked that that you know the 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 life of Jesus is so much in contrast to uh, what they see in the Quran. And again, I'm not saying this in a very demeaning way, but Muhammad was supposed to have had so many wives, and uh, you know he lived such a terrible life, um, which they are all aware of. And then, in contrast to that, to read the life, the ministry, and the teachings of Jesus, just the Gospels, opens their eyes because. They've always been told, you know, Jesus is a prophet, leave him alone, focus on Muhammad, and accept Muhammad for who he is and the way he lived and all that he did. But they've never been exposed to who Jesus really is. So we have Muslims coming to faith by just reading the Gospels and knowing for them, seeing for themselves the life of Jesus Christ and his teachings. 
that his teachings are so different from what Muhammad uh, taught and what the Quran teaches. Right? So you have Muslims who come to faith because of that. And thirdly, you have Muslims who come to faith just because of the the gospel message, the fact that you can come into a personal relationship with God, you can be forgiven, that God can become your father. That again, like we said, like what we explained here, is a very, very different, very different from what they have heard and what they've been taught. Right? So keep this in mind that there is no there's no one way for a Muslim. There's this there's not like everybody has the same experience. There are those who have personal encounter with Jesus, supernatural encounter. There are those who are affected by the gospel account of Christ. And then there are those who are affected by the gospel message, which is that you, you're, you could have personal forgiveness and come into a personal relationship with God, which is it's non-existent. It's not there in anything that they have heard taught under Islam. So when we present Jesus, if we can present Jesus in this manner, uh, it's going to help them, uh, you know, explore Christ and know Christ. The challenge, like we said earlier, is uh, the the concept of a triune God is very difficult because they've been said taught there's only one God. Um, the titles of Jesus being Son of God and that is a big, difficult thing for them to accept mentally. And also, sometimes, depending on whether they're a traditional Muslim or a modern Muslim, traditional Muslims will question the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But then we have a way to answer that, to explain logically that he had to die. Just, just go through the gospel accounts. This is what happened. But these are the points where there would be challenges. But uh, if we can present the gospel in a simple way, help them see the difference, that would be great. So let's pause for some questions. Any questions here so far? Everybody with me? Anyone? Okay. All right, so we have touched on the two major religions, um, Hinduism and Islam. Just keep these points in your mind. So whenever you enter into a conversation with a Hindu or a Muslim, we're able to present the gospel. So the gospel message doesn't change. You're presenting Jesus. But how we communicate, uh, if we can just you know be sensitive to their background, then it will help us uh, communicate Jesus a little more clearer for them so that they can understand who Christ is and then make a decision to follow Christ. So now we're going to change focus again. And we're going to try to look at this big area called suffering. Because there are a lot of questions. You know, why is there suffering in this world? If God is a good God, if God created everything, uh, if God loves us, why is all these things happening? You know, all kinds, all kinds. And then especially when, you know, innocent people suffer. When uh, good people suffer. See, so there are a lot of these questions around this subject of suffering. Why is there all this suffering happening? So we want to try to understand suffering from a biblical perspective. You know, this is uh, what the Bible says. And uh, first of all, we need to understand it ourselves and then also be able to answer questions that people ask 
about suffering. Okay, so we're going to shift our thinking a little bit now. We're moving away from this whole um, section on the person of Christ. We're moving to another section now on dealing with questions on suffering. Okay, so let's step into that. I will share the PDF. So, what we want to do here is to get a biblical understanding of suffering. And then, you know, try to answer questions. Uh, like I was just mentioning some things, you know, that, that come around, around this whole area of suffering and evil that we see in the world. So, to get an understanding, a biblical understanding of suffering, we need to start with the God's heart. Right? I mean, because many times people blame God for suffering. People blame God. But we need to get a right picture. So let's start at the very beginning. Right? Now, what we see here, and I'm not turning to all the scriptures, but I want to just mention in Genesis chapter 1, very first chapter, after God created everything, the Bible says, God saw all that He'd created and He saw that it was good. You know, that means in God's original creation, in His original work on the earth, there was no evil. There was no sin. There was no sickness that he had put on this planet. And uh, secondly, we see in chapter 2 that he had kept the tree of life. And he told Adam, you can eat of the Adam and Eve, you know. You can eat of this tree of life. And what was this tree of life for? Uh, if you look into Revelation 21 and 22, it just talks, you know, indicates, not states directly, but it indicates uh, healing for the nations or wellness or wholeness or life and strength. So it doesn't mean Adam and Eve were going to fall sick because there was no sickness, there was no sin, but there was already something that God had kept in the garden for Adam and Eve to have that would just perpetuate, just keep on giving them life, strength, and wholeness. And that's what he's going to do in the new heavens and the new earth. There's going to be the tree of life whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. That means it's, the, the, you know, it's interesting because 21, chapter 21, 22 say there will be no more sickness, no more pain, no more suffering. And there's also this tree of life. So it's not to cure her, but it's to perpetuate, to just continue to give us life, strength, and wholeness. So if you look at the beginning, the first part, there was no suffering. There was no pain. There was no sorrow. There were no tears. There was no anguish. It was not there in the garden before the fall. And... When we look into Revelation 21, 22, we see it's not there in the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, so in the beginning and in the future, these things that cause pain and sorrow and tears and anguish and suffering are not there. So in the beginning and even in the future. They're not there. So we must therefore understand who God is in this context. And we must say that, or I, 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 I would say, uh, it's safe to say, it's safe to come to this conclusion that it is not the heart of God for people to experience suffering, pain, sorrow, tears, and anguish. That's not God's original intent. 
Why? Because it was not there in the beginning, and it is not going to be there in the future. So that's something very, that's clearly indicating to us God does not want it for us. Others, he would have kept it there, you know, make sure there's always suffering, pain, sorrows, and tears. He would have made sure it was already there in the garden before the fall. But that's not the case. So what I'm trying to say is, you look at God's plan, overall plan, and try, and then we can come to this conclusion that it is not God's, it is not in God's heart for all the suffering and evil and sin and pain and all those things. That's not part of His heart. So we know that before the fall. Lucifer and his fallen angels were there, and uh, but they had rebelled against God. God didn't create them that way. They had rebelled against God. They were cast out of heaven, and they made it their agenda to get a place on earth. So Lucifer came, Satan came in the form of a serpent, he deceived Adam and Eve, got them to disobey God, and then sin came into this world. And that disobedience is what opened the door to all form of evil. But remember that this was not the plan of God. It was not God's original intent. God didn't plan for Adam to sin and uh, for all this thing to come into the world. That was not. He had told Adam, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You eat from the tree of life. So demonstrate your obedience and have a long life. But the devil got it up opposite. He said, "If you know, basically, if you disobey God, you're going to ex you will experience death. And that's what the devil got Adam and Eve into. And that opened the door to all kinds of evil. So we should not blame God, even for the original sin. It was Adam's responsibility. We shouldn't blame God for the door being opened to evil coming into this world. God didn't open the door. Adam did. And through Adam's disobedience, or Adam and Eve, when I say Adam, I mean both Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God. And through that came spiritual death and physical death and everything that followed. And so now this earth that God had created, which was perfect and good, which he had entrusted to Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve opened the door, let the enemy come in, and with it, all sin and sickness and disease, everything coming in. But in the midst of that, the Bible says, God continues to work. And what does God do? He executes loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. So God is still willing to work, or God is still working on the earth, even though the door has been opened by Adam and Eve to the devil and what he's doing. But God is still working. And so what we need to understand in, in our minds is we are seeing suffering and evil in this world. God is a big God, very powerful God, who is also working on the earth. But why is all this going on? And what, what good can come out of all this? Right? That's something we need to try and understand. And when we face or when we see things happening, in our minds, we need to be able to, to whatever extent possible, see the big picture. And even though in a specific situation we may not have an answer, at least we can see the big picture and say, okay, you know what? 
from the perspective of the big picture, I can understand it. I may not have an answer for every individual situation. It is painful what people are going through, but at least I understand the big picture and that can give us some sense of um, resolution. So let's look at it. Suffering ever since the fall, um, sin came into this world and there'd been the associated evil. And Jesus made it very clear in John 16, verse 33. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So he said, you know, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, let it not be afraid. And he said, in this world, you know, you will have tribulation. So there is tribulation, difficulties, hardships, all kinds of things happening in this world. We understand that. We are not denying that. Secondly, we understand that suffering could be in different areas. It could be spiritual. It could be emotional. It could be physical. Um, then the enemy, Satan, attacks, causing problems in all these areas. And there are other reasons why there are problems happening, spiritual, emotional, physical. And all In all realms, there is suffering. People can face pain and hurt and distress in all of these areas. But biblically, if we want to break it down, and understand why is there suffering? I want us to look at these reasons here. And we will go through this, each of these in detail. But biblically, when we break it down, why do people face suffering? Why do things happen? And I want to break and I break it down into these six six uh, statements or you know you can say categories one there is suffering due to what people refer to or what the bible refers to as the bondage of corruption we'll talk about it then there is suffering due to one's own actions and then there is suffering due to satanic oppression that means the devil does things then there is suffering due to other people's actions. That means other people are being evil, causing pain and suffering to others. There is suffering due to divine judgment, when God has to judge sin. And then there is suffering due to willing sacrifice. That means people are, you know, do this willingly, and they, you know, they, they, they are willing to endure suffering. So. Let's try and understand each of these as we, you know, try to understand this subject of suffering. Let me pause here. I just want to make sure we're all together. Um, so far, everyone's fine. You're together. Any questions? Okay. All right. Let's move forward. Let's get um, started with the first one. Suffering due to the bondage of corruption. So let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I'll just introduce this and we will explain it further next week. Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 8. Let's read, please. Somebody could read for us. 8, 17 to 23, please. Somebody could read that passage for us. We'll get started and we'll go into it. Somebody could read. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 to 23. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co heirs of Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. 
I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the certain way, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Mm. Thank you. So, Paul, um, this is in Romans 8, 17 to 23. Paul, he says, look, we are children of God. We are heirs, joint heirs. I mean, we have this wonderful place as children of God. We are the heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. I'm looking at verse 17 now. And yet, we suffer. And he says, but if we suffer with him or for him, we will be glorified. So we are heirs. God has brought us into this amazing place of being children of God, heirs of God, joint us with Christ. And yet, look, there's the other side. There is suffering here. But then, the suffering is, he's trying to let us know that it's a, it's a, temporary time boxed thing because after all of this we will be glorified it's going to result in some amazing glory so there is beautiful place to begin with god has brought us as children of god there's going to be glory but now okay, there is some suffering we're going to go through then he begins to explain to us why there is suffering Verse 18, he says, you know, yeah, verse 18, the sufferings we're going through in this time box period of life here on earth, it is it is cannot be even compared to the glory that we are going to experience in the future. So, you know, let's encourage ourselves with that. And then he said, verse 19, and he says, even creation is waiting with expectation for the glory that we are going to partake of as sons and daughters of God. It means even creation is looking forward to that, just as much as we are looking forward to that glory that God will give to us. Even creation is looking forward to it. Then he begins to explain why creation is looking forward to that. Verse 20, because creation was subject to futility not willingly that means god didn't plan this god didn't want to do this but he let it happen with hope or in expectation what happened verse 21 and the the, the expectation is that creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. So right now, creation is in the state that we refer to as, it is in bondage to corruption. Now we can understand it, that from the time, so when God created everything, everything was perfect and good, but when Adam sinned, everything was subject to corruption. So, right now, creation itself is in bondage to corruption or decay. Um, it's, it has deviated from its original state of being good. But verse 21 says, it, creation also will be delivered, just as we are going to be delivered from the present suffering, 
creation also will be delivered from its state of being in bondage to corruption and experience the kind of liberty that we are going to experience as children of God. Verse 22, he says, all of creation is groaning and laboring with birth pangs until now. That's like, it is also waiting, you know, uh, for this glorious, uh, uh, lib glory, day of glory that we're going to experience. Right now it's going through pains in expectation of it. Okay, so here's the thing. All of creation was subject, put in bondage to corruption. It went into corruption. That means God created everything perfect. He created everything to, he put in all the processes, everything to, for func to function well. But from the time of the fall, creation itself went into corruption. It decayed. It deviated from its original design. So, example. Adam and Eve were created to live perpetually, physically. In their bodies, they would not die. The bodies were not designed to die. But after this fall, they died spiritually, and eventually their bodies also died, decayed. Now it took time, decayed. So imagine those days they lived 700 years, 800 years, and then died. Today it's shortened, you know, we're 70, 80, 90, something like that. For those days, it was 10 times more. And everything else that we see, there was no sickness, but sickness came in. There was no disease, disease came in. Uh, babies would have been born perfect, but babies could be deformed. You know, uh, that was not God's design. Uh, so many things that, you know, I'm sure that in God's earth, at the very beginning, there were no earthquakes and tsunamis and weather phenomena that would be destructive. But now creation is subject to corruption. They're deviating from its original design. But what Paul has said here in Romans 8 is, even creation will be delivered and brought into a place of glory, which is what Revelation 21 and 22 teach us. And God makes new heavens and new earth. None of these problems will be there. So we will talk more about this next week. But the first reason why there is suffering is because everything which was created good from the time of the fall has started deviating or going away from its original state of being perfect. It's becoming corrupted. It's became corrupt. It's decaying. And God let it happen because he knows that in the end he's going to bring it back into a place of glory. Okay. So think about this. We will um, discuss this further next week and explain it further take up any questions on it as well. Okay, let's close in prayer. Uh, can somebody close in prayer and dismiss the class? We'll get ready for our next lecture as well. Anybody can pray and dismiss us. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to end of the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful class we have. God, we declare that uh, you are God. Uh, Jesus, we love you. We thank you for coming down uh, for us. Thank you for taking all our sins upon the cross. We thank you for never leaving us, and we thank you for your love towards us, Jesus. Even though we suffer a little while here, we believe there is a great glory waiting for us, Lord. Mm -hmm. Help us to strengthen ourselves in you. Help us to build our faith in you, Jesus. I 
Please each one of my classmates into your hands, be with them and guide them. I bless them in the name of Jesus. As we learn about you, Lord, as we learn about how to share the gospel with others, give us that boldness and courage to step out and to share it with love and in the right way. We bless Pastor Ashish. We are so thankful for his teachings, God. Uh, be with him and be his strength in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Thank you. And we will meet again. God bless. Bye now. Bye Thank now. you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless.